Hi, and welcome to this presentation. Um, my name is Rich Nins, and I'm a technical advisor at Sheffield Hallam University. The title of the presentation is The Accessibility Revolution in Assistive Technology and What It Means for Us. So, um, this is really um, a presentation just about some of the trends in assistive technology and what's happened on the ground, what you can expect to see more of um, in the next few years, and also what it means for us as practitioners as well and supporting disabled students. My central thesis really is that assistive technology is becoming much more accessible. It's becoming easier to access, so it's becoming much easier for our students to get hold of outside of the, the recognised systems, DSA, access to work, apprenticeship funds and so on. So it's becoming easier for them to get and it's also becoming a lot easier to use as well, which is because of trends happening in the way software is, is developed nowadays too, which I'll talk about. Um, so I've been in assistive technology since uh, the mid 2000s and um, for a long time, I think things have been very stable in the way that we deliver assistive technology to the users. A lot of assistive technology is purchased through government schemes for users, whether they be students, employees and so on, or, or purchased through local councils or colleges or things like that. There's been a high upfront cost to assistive technology traditionally. In most software packages, top £100, many go into the hundreds of pounds up to possibly even thousands of pounds for specialist software or equipment for visually impaired students. And that's kind of been unavoidable, really. It's just um, the only way it's been viable for a lot of companies to, de um, to develop and deliver assistive technology. The technology, as I've said, because it's been sold through government schemes, a lot of the discussion and dialogue around what's needed in assistive technologies has been between the developers of the technology and the gatekeepers, if you like. People like us, um, assessors, disability advisors, the resellers who sell the technology for the developers, and people like me who work, work in assistive technology. So again, that's another thing which is, it's kind of been, there's nothing wrong with it really, it's a natural thing that's happened because it's been very hard for developers to get feedback directly from the users. And there's been this very traditional model of providing software or technology. So you might get some software which will run on just one computer, you'll get a license key and it'll just work there. It'll only work on your Windows PC, it won't work on your Mac PC if you've got one of them as well, and vice versa. And you get one piece of software, you might get some updates with it as it goes along, some security updates. But for the upgrades, you need to pay for a new version. And for new features, you might need to pay for a better version, and so on. And I think that's meant that the software has been developed probably in quite a, a particular way where features and customization have been emphasized really um, rather than the user experience. I think now though particularly in the last few years we're starting to move into what's called the software as a service model where the developers of technologies are much more concerned about selling and interacting directly with the user of the technology. And the user kind of leases the technology rather than purchasing it outright. And we're all probably familiar with this model from our Netflix and Spotify and Apple Music subscriptions, where we pay a certain amount each month and then we get access to those platforms to you know, watch the TV shows or listen to the music on those platforms, but when we stop paying, that's it, our access after a short time is, is cut. And that kind of model 
it's kind of taken over software really as well if you think about Adobe Cloud, you think about Office 365, suddenly that software that might have cost you two, three hundred, four hundred pounds up front to buy now costs you five, six, ten pounds a month. So you can spread the cost much more easily. So specialist software or even just software that we need for a particular purpose, it's become a lot more accessible now to the consumers. And it's, it's much more easy to find um, for users too, because they don't have to get a software catalogue or come to us to ask what software is available. There's app stores, they can market it through the web, advertise through Google and YouTube and so on to get their software, their technology into their users' hands. Now there are a few other really important characteristics here with this model of providing software which are really important for the user and for us to understand. The software is typically cloud-based so um, you might get a small app on your computer or you might use it purely through the web but a lot of the software works via the internet so you need to be connected all the time. We can often use the software on any platform or technology on any platform at all. And we can have it installed on Windows, Macs, our phones, whatever. The software always stays up to date. So before we used to have a lot of issues where students might have a particular version of Windows and then the version of their software didn't work on that version of Windows. So a lot of those issues have kind of gone now. Windows 10 is operating on this service model. So students, if they've got Windows, will always have, should always have the most up-to-date version of Windows. And then if they've got the most up-to-date version of software as well, those problems kind of go away. And I think really importantly, um, for this kind of software model or technology model, the developers are much more interested in getting the feedback from the user than from the gatekeepers like us. And they'll use the data from the product as well for feedback. So they'll look at things like how many clicks it takes someone to get to a particular feature. Does someone, how many, do people try to use a particular feature and then give up? You know, all that data is kind of going back to the developer so they can improve the product. And what app often happens as, as a result of that is products get simplified over time and they become easier to use. A really, really good example of this type of approach to software is Grammarly. So Grammarly is a proofing tool, it does spell checking, it does a lot of the things that we associate with some of the literacy software that people get through DSA, so it checks for homophones, um, mistakes, and so on. It also does stuff which is only really possible because of the data it's getting from the user, such as being able to correct verb tenses, or very specific types of errors, and to advise on writing style. The really interesting thing about Grammarly, it doesn't advertise itself as assistive technology, it doesn't use any of the terminology we usually see when assistive technology is marketed. It markets itself as a tool for people in school or college or in work who need a bit of writing support. And it markets directly to them through Google, through YouTube adverts, even TV adverts as well in the States. And the user pays through subscription and can use the app on pretty much any device they want. Again, there's a massive focus on simplification, on user experience in tools like Gram Grammarly. And when I talk about this simplification, it's worth actually giving a bit of an example here. So we'll look at speech to text in, 
this regard. This is Dragon. It's a, a screenshot I grabbed off the internet. Um, we can see Dragon's got its toolbar. It's got lots of menus underneath that toolbar. It's got the correction menu, which has got about 10 different options. And I'm not a criticism at all. I, I really love Dragon. I've trained loads and loads of students to use it. But it's a specialist app. It's got a degree of complexity and it needs a degree of training. Recently, and this is something I'll, I'll talk about in a little while as well, which is really important. The main technology platforms have started to build some of these access tools into their own products. So Microsoft now has speech to text, which is the dictate feature. It's available in home. And you can see up on the top right hand corner, we've got the dictate button. We press it and we literally start talking. And that's basically the dictate feature. Mac OS is kind of even more simple, really. You press a keyboard shortcut, you get a little icon, and you talk, and when you're done, you press the button and it's transcribed your work for you. And that's basically how you use speech to text on a Mac device. There's a massive trade off there between what I've talked about in terms of sophistication, customization. For usability you can't at the moment do any of the kind of really cool correction stuff or vocabulary extensions we do in dragon but the idea is that kind of approach to speech to text is going to be good enough for a lot of people so that gives a quick overview of how the approach to developing these technologies and making these technologies available is changing. There are a lot of implications of this. I've talked a lot about simplification. So the way technologies are being developed now, they're being, being developed to make, make them as user friendly as possible. That does mean you're going to lose some degree of the customization, the complexity that some users are going to need. Pricing and distribution. So um, it, it means that assistive technologies are potentially going to be available, and they are available actually, in terms of if you think about things like Grammarly, they are available to students to purchase themselves or to, to start using before they even get to the stage of seeing us in our roles. And, you know, some of these technologies, they're not really very compatible with the systems we've got at the moment. I know, for example, um, Grammarly isn't available through DSA. And that isn't really the fault of anybody. It's just that as a company, it doesn't choose to work with resellers. It, it wants to sell directly to its users and it does want to sell directly to universities and workplaces as well. That's its model. So sometimes students may be coming in asking for technologies and it may be difficult for us to provide them. I think privacy is important as well. That's a big consideration. So a lot of these tools more and more are going to rely on taking our data, feeding it into their own algorithms to make their product better, to make their product viable. And there are privacy issues about if we're downloading free tools or inexpensive tools or tools from companies that we don't know much about, what are they actually doing with our data? And to be honest, most of us are not going to read these massive privacy policies or user agreements that we tend to have to click a box to say that we've read to use the product. To continue with this theme of simplification, one of the really interesting things we start to see is that the assistive technology or the things that we're used to be, um, we're used to thinking of as assistive technology, they start to kind of become ubiquitous and, and then they start to kind of become invisible really and that's one of the key maxims with technology really that's been said for a long time good technology kind of becomes invisible after a while we stop thinking about it stop thinking about that it's there it just works
And I mean, this is my idea of a very rough model of how assistive technology develops. You tend to get this identification of need. You get specialist hardware and software. That gets simplified, refined, and so on, until eventually we start to see some of these softwares turning up in mainstream applications. And I'll give an example of that in terms of what we, what we refer to as OTR, optical character recognition, to make it easier. This is the first book scanner, really, that existed. Um, Kurzweil's reading machine, which I think, you know, you'd essentially, I don't know how it works, but you'd put the book under a camera and it would read back to you. Quite crude, but incredibly revolutionary at the time. These devices still exist, you know, really in, in some forms and you know, they're still they're still sold to people that uh, just want a, a device to read their letters or the newspaper and don't want anything more sophisticated. As computing became more mainstream, people started to use their PCs, flatbed scanners for doing scanning, and then software became available for us to scan books and format them and create more accessible formats. That's something some of us are familiar with. I used to do a lot of accessible format production. And you're essentially taking advantage of two kind of mainstream advices and devices and some software to make that work. Around the late 2000s, we had smartphones come in and then suddenly we had one device, which could kind of do everything really. We didn't need the PC and the scanner because we had it in just one device, especially as the cameras became better and better on the smartphones. And you might be able to, you might need an app to do it, but you'd be able to find an app really easily by going to the App Store, the Play Store, just searching for scanning. And then where we are now, um, we, at the moment, um, Google has developed its camera app, so you don't even really need any software, special software to extract text. On the premium Google phones at the moment, so the pixel range, Google's lens technology is built in to the camera app. So you take a picture and if it's got text in, it'll automatically transcribe it for you anyway. So you can copy and paste that out of the picture. And that's not really designed for our kind of uses in terms of, you know, we might want to scan a book chapter and make it more accessible. It's more designed for, I guess, Google's own aims of making all information searchable. So not just text, but images as well. And being able to use AI to find out what's going on in pictures and make it that easier for users to find what they need. So this kind of use of OCR, it's quite useful if you want to take pictures of a few different pages and then you want to be able to search to find the text that's in those pictures later on. Or you just want to use it for your own notes as a reminder and copy and paste. It's not really that useful if you want to scan an entire book chapter. It's not really designed for that. So there's always going to be that tension between simplifying these technologies and being able to use them for the specific purposes that we need them. So for a student with a print impairment, being able to scan 20 pages really easily and get it into a text format is really important. So they would still probably need that specialist software to help them do that. And so as we've seen, a lot of the things that we've always thought of as assistive technology are starting to become more just technology really, they're starting to become part of mainstream applications and perhaps that identification of them as assistive technology is kind of going to move away over the next few years. When we think about kind of access tools, text to speech, speech to text, advanced spell checking and so on, that we that often get provided through DSA. These tools now are starting to become standard features of some of the main mainstream technology platforms. So Microsoft has the immersive reader. 
and it has that in Office 365. It has it in its Edge browser. It has it available in some forms in its mobile apps as well. So it's phone apps, it's tablet apps. And those kind of access tools that were previously the preserve of the kind of software that we get through DSA are now becoming available in these platforms and often in a much simplified form as well. So moving on from Microsoft to Google, if we use Google Docs, we have speech to text available in that. We have text to speech available there as well. And this is re actually really hard to kind of show, to be honest. Um, but the kind of advanced spell checking that tools like Grammarly and Ginger do are now available in Google applications as well. So, for example, here I've got the word your instead of you, and it's corrected that. It will correct those verb tense errors as well really easily. And Google has a great advantage, and Microsoft to some extent as well, in developing these tools, just because of the sheer amount of data that it gets back from users that it can feed back into their algorithms. So its text-to-speech will get better because of the speech-to-text that's being used. And all those people dictating into Google Docs or Office 365, that's helping to improve the different companies' text-to-speech platforms. Um, spell checking, people are checking their spellings every day in Google. They're writing into Google Docs every day and then correcting it. And all this is being fed back into the into their learning models and making these applications, making these features better as time goes on. And it's quite difficult to compete with that really, I guess, for many companies. And here's a couple of examples of where Google's used these assistive technologies for its own unique and sometimes perhaps slightly worrying applications. So Google has has developed not just word prediction but phrase prediction. So as we type um, into Gmail, for example, in a faint colour it comes up with what we might want to, want to say and then we press tab and completes it for us. So it's kind of using its technologies to predict what we want to do or say before we say it. The image on the right, it's difficult to, to show this really, but Google has developed its speech and its uh, text-to-speech technologies so that it can actually ring companies for you or ring, make phone calls for you. So Google can ring a restaurant for you and make a reservation and then get back to you and tell you what time it's made the reservation for. So it's used the text-to-speech and the speech technologies along with its own AI capacities to develop a, a very kind of unique Google-style service. I think it's only available in, a, in America at the moment and I don't think it's actually been taken up that much, but it's quite interesting. And Apple Apple's business is around selling devices, so they, they were really the first company um, to really go all in on providing all these access tools built into the system, and Mac OS, you've got the text-to-speech, the speech-to-text, the voiceover, which is the full screen reader for visually impaired users, and similarly, iOS, iPhone, iPad OS, even their, their Apple Watch has all these technologies built into them from the start. So what is assistive technology if then, if these kind of access tools start to just become part of the mainstream technology offer? Well, I think there has been a movement within DSA over the last few years to more unique applications, really, alongside the kind of access tools that are provided. 
So just some quick examples. We've got PresentPal, which is designed to support people with live presentations and probably wouldn't have been possible really until smartphones, tablets became mainstream. Quatio is text app have developed, so looking at the text to speech, speech to text and so on, that's available for STEM subjects and supporting students with that. And Claro Writing Helper, which is very new, so some of you might not have seen yet, but it provides like one application and one place to support all the tasks related to writing an assignment. And students, a lot of students will still need the access tools that will give them more customization and control over their experience. So I think those tools will be around for a while yet. But as we can see, the assistive technology seems to be a moving target. And as some of those access tools become more mainstream, we're starting to see more focus again on specialist tools within DSA. And I think the other thing that's really important here as well is the changes that are happening and that are coming in higher education as well. So we know the government has or wants a lot more focus, a lot more people doing STEM subjects, a lot more focus on vocational training. And we, we already have students coming in on degree apprenticeships who are very, very capable, but have often left school when they were 16. So need a lot, need more support and perhaps need different kind of tools than that we've been traditionally providing for DSA. And this is a slide I used last year in a presentation, which just uses that kind of reversing the pyramid theme that we've seen in higher education since the DSA reforms. And I think it's really applicable to what's happening in assistive technology too at the moment as well. So we have more DSA use perhaps more for the supply of those specialist hardware and software tools. In the middle somewhere, we have all those kind of user friendly access tools um, that are extensive and have a lot of customization options, things that perhaps are provided through DSA, but we can provide as site licenses as well on campus. And then at the bottom, for the inclusive offer, we're really focusing on all the, all the access tools within the mainstream technology platforms. So in Office 365, the learning tools, iOS, and so on. Just to talk briefly about our approach at Sheffield Hallam, which I think has influenced my perspective quite a bit. I mean, we exited. DSA in 2017, and we stopped doing one-to-one -one, um, training through Disabled Students Allowance, AT training, and we moved to doing group sessions to all students. And I mean, yeah, students that came to the sessions loved the tools, particularly the mind mapping, um, the recording software, and you know they would often say it's great, but how can I use it at home? And we don't really have answers for that at the moment for some for some assistive technology um, and it gets to that crux again of what people expect from software they don't expect just to use it on one computer or in one place they expect to be able to use it everywhere and pre-pandemic that influenced us more to go towards looking at things like the office 365 learning tools and the microsoft learning tools for those basic access tools, because all our students get Office 365 subscriptions when they enrol. Um, focusing on things like mobile tools, so we have audio note taker, but really they can get Sonocent Link as well and as the app on the mobile device. And that's really something they can use anywhere rather than having to come into university to use. And we have these tools on what, what we use as apps anywhere which is the software delivery system that's used on campus so students can use software while they're on campus. We hope eventually that that will work off campus for students as well, but there's lots of technicalities there in terms of licensing and things like that. 
and it's working through those problems of you know having software that was designed for the desktop era and expanding it out to the way that we use technology today and we offer assistive technology inductions for disabled students as well so we offer the group sessions for all students but for disabled students we're able to offer appointments where we can explore and guide them to find out what kind of assistive technology is suitable for them before they go through the DSA process. And from the lockdown and beyond, this process has kind of intensified. We've been able to get some of our software temporarily available for students to use on their own devices. We're doing all our sessions through Zoom, which has actually improved our spring and summer take up and um, you know improved attendance and things like that. And we're working towards what we've got now, now at SHU, which is this extended campus model for the next year or so, where everything that's been available traditionally on campus, and we're trying to make available off campus as well. So to conclude, I think there are some key points that we can take from this. There's a lot of change happening in technology and assistive technology, which can be quite scary but also very exciting and, and liberating for our students as well. The fact that students have access to text-to-speech, speech-to-text from their first day on campus or perhaps even before is really, really exciting as a development and will really help us to improve take-up of these technologies. And I think as well, students, they'll often have been using this assistive technology before they arrive so they won't be waiting for their DSA assessment or their guidance appointments to find out about the technology they may be coming in and you know they may potentially know more than us when they arrive and they may may have been using <coughs> assistive technology in forms which it's not really marketed as assistive technology so they don't even see it as that they just see it as tools to support them Again, going back to things like Grammarly and Ginger. I think we have to get used to very constant change and unexpected change sometimes <clears throat> with assistive technology. Um, as the applications and the technologies we use kind of update themselves and you know, refine themselves slightly, remove things that are not being used, add new things, it's, it's much more of a challenge to keep up and keep our resources up to date and support the students who might struggle with constant changes to user interfaces or technologies or features. We can't just expect these technologies to stay the, stay the same for one, two, three years. I think finally as well, um, many of us working with assistive technologies, we can start to move from that kind of gatekeeper role that we've always had, perhaps as assessors or assistive technology advisors, to more of a guide role, where we're talking about what kind of technologies are available on different platforms, what kind of free, even inexpensive apps are available for students to use and I think as well we can be finding out and learning ourselves from the students about what kind of strategies they've been using with technology to support their studies and that's been happening for a few years now I think for a lot of us so anyway that's it thank you for watching um, if you've got any comments or questions feel free to give me an email directly. I probably won't get back to you until late August as I'm on annual leave now, but I'd certainly love to hear from you. So again, thanks and take care and goodbye.